a measurement guy. I measure the effectiveness of governments and charities all over the world. And I've always been passionate about public policy. I've believed in the power of government to do good things in this world. And then I came across a statistic that shocked me, a statistic that was so compelling that it threatens the very foundations of our democracy. And that statistic is this. Only 18% of the people in this country trust our government. 18%? That's scary. How can we possibly sustain our way of life if we don't believe in our own government? And globally, that statistic isn't very different. Only 14% of people trust their national governments around the world. So why is trust so low? Well, there's two competing explanations. The first is, it's all about the people. It's about the political leadership. Well, it's all about this guy. It's Donald Trump's fault. That's why we don't trust government. But the data doesn't support that. In fact, trust was lower during certain times in the Obama administration than it is in the Trump administration. And all throughout history, Democrat to Republican, Republican to Democrat, trust continues to decline, other than a temporary spike during 9-11. So if it's not about the people, the other philosophy is it's about the spending. Yeah, we're not spending enough money on the people who really need it. But the data doesn't support that either. In fact, we spend 16% of our GDP on social programs. When you factor in private social spending, it's the second highest in the entire OECD. We're spending over $3 trillion a year on social outcomes. And all through the years, as spending has gone up, trust has actually gone down. So clearly, it's not about spending. So what does explain trust? Well, my theory is this. The reason why we don't trust our government is not because we hate it or we think it's evil. The reason why we don't trust government is because it doesn't work. It doesn't produce results. It doesn't produce a bang for the buck for our tax dollar. And all of the most important social issues, year after year, are only getting worse. More people are in poverty and economically insecure now than in many, many years. The rate of food insecurity is the highest it's ever been in modern history. And obesity for children has doubled in the past 30 years. There are many other statistics I can share with you, and you've read them in the paper and seen them with your own eyes. But social problems are not getting any better. And even here in Illinois, we did a survey to ask people how much they think government works. And 80% of the people in Illinois gave government a C, a D, or an F in terms of producing outcomes. And that was during a Democratic administration. So if government doesn't work, how can we make it work better? Well, it turns out we have a big black box problem. Government is the only sector of the economy that only measures after they invest. We literally spray money all over the place and hope it adds up to some outcomes. But no other part of the economy works this way. There's no lawyer that goes into court and then checks Westlaw or LexisNexis after the case is over. Nobody gives you a mortgage and then checks your credit score afterward. Nobody invests in a public company and then checks the Bloomberg terminal later. We have predictive data that helps us determine how we allocate our resources to produce the best bang for the buck, the best return on our investment. Now, some would say, well, it's impossible to predict government effectiveness or the effectiveness of social programs. They're all so different. They're operating in different contexts with different people. We can never possibly compare one program to another. But we have cracked the code on complex things before. 
In fact, we've cracked the code on human biology with the Human Genome Project. What's more complex than that? And we can predict health outcomes by looking at the common genes among people. And we've also cracked the code on music with Pandora's Music Genome Project. We can now compare songs like, and music like Taylor Swift to Aerosmith to Coldplay by realizing that they all have the same underlying genes, the same core elements, things like timbre, and rhythm, and degree of improvisation, or guitar solos. And we can code those songs to compare them to predict which songs you will like. So I had this idea, this crazy idea that if we could code biology, and if we could crack the code on music, why couldn't we crack the code on social programs? So on a lark, I reached out to the guy who invented the music genome project for Pandora. His name is Dr. Nolan Gasser of Stanford. And I sent him an email, I said, hey Nolan, how would you like to do for the world what you did for music? <laughs> Three hours later, I got an email saying, I'm in. And together, we created something called the Impact Genome Project. It is one of the most ambitious undertakings in the history of social science. And here's how it works. We started reading articles, research studies about social programs, some that worked, some that didn't like this one on science, technology, engineering, and math. It was about a summer camp for STEM. And at first it seemed like all these studies were different. They all used different words and phrases and concepts. But then as we started highlighting splices of text, certain genes popped out at us. Well, all these programs are doing similar things. This one's playing with toys, and this one has kids playing with Legos, and this one has kids playing with robots but they're all using the same mechanism or gene of hands-on active learning. And we realized that some genes were more technical in nature. Things like dosage, how many hours at a time people were involved in a program, or duration or frequency. And some genes were more nuanced, things like uh, degree of parental involvement or whether there was leadership training. And we could code those genes from zero to five or incidental to dominant, depending on how involved they were in the program design. And we had this uncanny belief that we could translate words into zeros and ones or data points and ultimately teach us what were the genetic compositions of different social interventions. And then we took it one step further we actually were able to attach statistical weights to each gene by using mass amounts of evidence to be able to understand why some programs worked and others didn't. And we were able to create algorithms to predict the impact of a program merely based on its genomic composition, just like we do in health or music. So what are the real world applications of this? Well, first, we have gone on to build genomes not only for science, technology, engineering, and math, but for education, for domestic violence, for youth development, for microfinance, for almost every major area of social impact. And the possibility of how to apply this has been really powerful. We started working with foundations who were giving grants. And we said, hey, instead of guessing what grants you think are going to be effective, why don't you try our genes? Let's work with the grantees to use our genes and see if we can make them more impactful. The results were awesome. Impact went up by 20 to 30% from those grantees that used evidence and science to design their programs versus those that merely guessed. And then I got a call from these guys. An office called the Privy Council of Canada it turns out it's part of the prime minister's cabinet, their domestic think tank, and they said, hey, we've heard you're working on this thing called the Impact Genome Project. Well, we want to be evidence-based and outcomes-driven in Canada. We want to produce better results for our citizens. So could you help us design programs with evidence? And so we started, first with a $100 million poverty reduction fund, and then moving on to helping them design programs around civic engagement and youth development. 
And now we're rolling this out across the government in different agencies. The dream is that we can use science to produce a better bang for the buck and make government more effective. And not just for Canada, but for governments all over the world. Because my belief is that first, we can start predicting instead of guessing. Second, we might someday be able to create twice the impact for half the cost. And third, someday, we can bend the arc of trust and restore faith in our democracy. Thank you.